Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Edmund Gehring. Uh, I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Louisiana Bar Foundation, and I'm also uh, in my spare time, I'm the General Counsel uh, for the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. I've been with the foundation for about 13 years, um, and my areas of uh, practice and coverage include uh, corporate governance issues, taxation issues, nonprofit, as you can imagine, uh, complex gifts and things of that nature. <clears throat> but I also have the privilege of working with an outstanding team of folks who uh, work in three very specific uh, but uh, useful areas. Uh, we assist donors in uh, fulfilling their philanthropic uh, wishes. Uh, we work with other aspects of our community, including our chamber, uh, and uh, local and state government, and that is on a regional basis as well, uh, to work in what we call civic leadership initiatives. And these are writ large projects that uh, even, even the foundation could not afford to do on its own, nor does it have the authority or the manpower uh, to handle. So oftentimes uh, state and local government, uh, our university systems uh, come in as partners on projects that we have either uh, imagined and envisioned or have brought to the table or have been brought to the table by others. So things like uh, the University Lakes Project in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or the Shaw Center uh, in downtown Baton Rouge, or probably most prominently now, uh, the Water Institute of the Gulf, which is a multidisciplinary scientific institution that we started about 10 years ago and has um, received uh, uh, great praise and tremendous success uh, over the last decade, uh, working all over the world. So we are very proud of that work. Um, but let me say welcome to all of you. We have, um, we had roughly 70 uh, participants registered. So forgive me for delaying for a few minutes while we wait for uh, those who may be late joining us to get on the call. Uh, the purpose of this, as you well know, and the reason that the Bar Foundation sponsors this activity from time to time is to uh, provide training in um, various areas of importance to our grantees. Um, Skip Phillips, Ralph Stevens, and I did this about seven or eight years ago uh, where we put on a little road show, traveled around the state, visited the legal service corporations, and talked about governance issues, finance issues, um, recruitment issues, working with your executive director, things of that nature. And from that, the idea sprang about uh, as we were doing this piecemeal over the course of that time to put together a much more extensive program that we could offer on a fairly regular basis um, to not only to the legal service corporations, but to our grantees uh, in order to talk about what it is that you should be doing as a board member of a grantee organization. And so um, there's really three strategic areas that we want to look at over the next six and a half hours in three days. Today, we'll talk about governance issues, uh, really kind of the meat of what it is that you should be paying attention to as a board member or a staff member uh, of a grantee organization. On Friday, we'll talk about programmatic and operational issues, and you'll hear from various uh, speakers there. Uh, you are burdened today with only hearing from me, and I apologize for that, but we will try to make this as interesting and as painless as possible. And then, fri uh, and then next week, I I'm sorry, next week, uh, we'll talk about uh, strategic planning and what I like to think of as aspirational issues. What what you should be thinking about for not only today as you manage your organization, but what you th should be thinking about in the future. Where are you headed? Uh, what are your plans? Uh, is everything going okay? Is there anything that we could be doing better? Those types of things. So you'll hear from Brent Henley on, uh, on those issues next week. He has conducted strategic planning for the Louisiana Bar Foundation on at least two occasions uh, that I have participated in. Uh, he is an outstanding presenter, very interesting, and it is one of, of the most efficient uh, strategic planning processes that I've ever participated in. So I hope that you will uh, not only enjoy that, uh, but have something to bring back to your various organizations. 
Just a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. And I, I do wanna acknowledge and recognize Renee LaBeouf from the Louisiana Bar Foundation. She has been the heart and soul of this committee and the activities that we've been able to put together. Renee and Donna Cuneo have put together, I think, remarkable uh, program for you. Uh, and hopefully you will find it to be valuable and worth the time that you have invested today and over the next couple of days. Uh, but Renee will be facilitating the PowerPoint presentation, so she will be managing the mute all and uh, the functions there. Uh, please, if you have the opportunity to ask questions, and I have not paused, uh, just use the chat function uh, to send those questions in. Then we can feed those to me, and hopefully I will stop, take a breath, and answer your questions. And I do plan to stop from time to time to pause uh, to give you an opportunity, but feel free to interrupt. Please feel free to ask questions as you see fit. Um, there is uh, a lot of material uh, covered in about a 45 page PowerPoint that we're gonna pop up here in a minute. I've provided that PowerPoint to Renee and I'm happy um, if she will share it with all of you at some point in the future, uh, but you will see it on the screen and then I will, I will drop off and we will get started. Before I do that, I do want to pause and say, Renee, uh, is there anything that we have missed or anything that we need to know before we continue? I think you covered it. Um, I'm going to keep everybody muted. As Edmund said, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself um, just to drown out, you know, background noise and things like that will keep everybody muted for the time being. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint and share my screen and we can get started. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Renee. Okay, so the topic for today, duties and responsibilities of board members. It's a very, it's a very general, uh, description of uh, several of the items that we're going to talk about today. Those are governance issues in general. Uh, we'll take a look at the IRS Form 990, which is your, as a nonprofit organization, it's your tax return. Uh, but it has an abundance of information in there that is useful to you as a staff member, as a board member, and the general public as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, recruiting and retention of not only board members, but staff as well. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up with um, a little bit of the working relationship between the board and your executive director. So we will move on to, I guess, Renee, do I need to tell you to switch slides? I'm sorry. I'm keeping up, but if you, if you see that I need to move forward, feel free to... Yeah, Give me a little, a, a little I, I, I want to try to avoid reading them as much as possible. But um, so this is for all of the lawyers on the call. This is the typical disclaimer that I'm giving you information. I'm not giving you legal advice. And there are there are uh, not only legal issues, but tax issues that are that are touched on in this issue. And, and please feel free to talk to your own professionals if you need that advice. Next slide. So what are your duties? Uh, as a director of a nonprofit corporation, where do they come from? Well, they come from they come from state law, in the in the open instance, but they also come from the IRS, and we'll talk a little bit that more as we move into the Form 990. Um, but your duties can also be enhanced by your own governance measures, which are explained in your bylaws. So. First note, if you are a board member and you've never taken an opportunity to read your articles of incorporation or your bylaws, I encourage you to do that. Um, that you, it may surprise you. You may learn things in there that you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing or that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Um, so take an opportunity to do that. Next slide. you owe a fiduciary responsibility and duty to your foundation, organization, or corporation. Um, being on a board is not an honorary position, and oftentimes people treat it as such. It is a serious obligation, and the breach of your 
duties can result in liabilities to you uh, and damage of, of unknown consequences to the corporation. When we say that there's liability to the director, that is not always covered by any typical insurances that the organization may carry. Uh, in some instances, you will find that either your professional liability through your uh, employment, such as a law firm, or your homeowner's liability in some cases can cover director liability, but the insurer, as you can imagine, has to be aware of that responsibility and then it has to be discussed and you will most likely pay for that coverage. Next slide. So what does a fiduciary duty mean? Uh, that you put the obligations of the corporations ahead of your own, what we call loyalty, uh, that you use judgment, diligence, and skill that ordinarily prudent persons would exercise. This is the reasonable man standard, so that you're exercising the care that a reasonable man would exercise under the same scenario. And that you act in good faith with the interests of the corporation in mind, meaning avoid conflicts of interest at almost all costs. Next slide. Or I probably just gave it away. A director should exercise the same degree of care, inquiry, and good faith in discharging the duties of a director as that person would exercise in dealing with his or her own affairs. So treat it like it's your own. What does loyalty mean? It means no conflicts of interest and no self-dealing that you should disclose any potential conflicts of interest or actual conflicts of interest. And then you should recuse yourself uh, from voting or even discussing those matters. So for instance, uh, an organization has the opportunity to do business with the, uh, the business or an individual who serves as a director. Uh, let's say that you're looking for a, a strategic planning consultant. Uh, and you happen to have one on your board. Well, that's very convenient, but there is the potential there, as you can see, for a conflict of interest. The director may say, well, of course, I, you know, I would love this business and I will do whatever it takes to get the business. And it seems very easy for the organization to simply hire one of its own. But you've now put a financial interest of paying a director uh, to provide their own particular professional services. Is this prohibited? No, it is not. It is not prohibited. It can happen. It, it simply has to be disclosed and discussed. If the organization chooses to move forward after having given it due diligence and consideration, it is perfectly acceptable, but it does set a precedent. And that would mean, okay, well, we did it for Director A, we can now do it for Director B down the road. Is that a practice that the organization wants to get into? Probably not. Now, you're sitting there as a director and you're saying, well, one of the reasons I got on this board was to hopefully cultivate some business. <laughs> yes, that is true. A lot of folks do join boards of directors in the hopes of cultivating business. Um, is it the most uh, opportune way to do so? No, it's not. Is it sometimes uh, easy? Yes, it is. Uh, herein lies the conflict. Uh, so you must, uh, you must, as an organization, use your own judgment. These decisions should not be left up to individual directors or even, I would argue, to the executive director to make those choices. When the opportunity arises, it should be, it should be discussed. Uh, if it is going to be move, moving forward, it should be approved by a, a, certainly a majority of directors. But I would tell you that these things really need unanimity if you are going to move forward. Next slide. Uh, and before that, um, Renee, I'm sorry, I saw a chat pop up. I'm going to go ahead and ask that. Could the, uh, Kathleen, thank you so much. Could the board member conduct the strategic planning pro bono without any conflicts? Uh, the answer to that is oftentimes, yes, the, those services are oftentimes provided pro bono. Is it a conflict? Uh, likely not. Does it have the potential to be a conflict? It does. 
And more importantly, does it appear to an outsider that it's a conflict? Well, it might because they don't know the financial arrangements that were made. So if, if watchdog organization sees that director A is providing strategic planning to the organization, they likely don't have any way of knowing that they're doing it for free. Um, so therein you see that there is still the potential for the conflict of interest and longer term, the controversy that could arrive from it. Um, can it be disclosed? It absolutely can. Should it be disclosed in advance? Yes, it should. Um, if you are a high profile organization, how do you do that? Do you, do you put out a press release to extinguish the fire before it happened? I don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think people handle that in different ways. I guess, I think the way that a lot of us conduct our business is that we would prefer not to be on the front page of the newspaper for things like this. And if you think this might have the potential for bad pub, pub, excuse me, publicity for your organization, then it's probably best to avoid it. Uh, because remember, we're not talking about just the simple fact of providing strategic planning. We're talking about the reputation of your organization. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But maintaining the high level of respect that your organization has in the community or in the population that it serves is probably paramount to any other considerations, even if you have to go out and pay for it. And Kathleen, I saw your follow-up that says... Um, that oftentimes board members will donate their skill, but we never use a board member for an audit. That's that you hit the nail on the head. That is probably the number one area where you should never use uh, internal folks or folks too close to it. We actually here in Baton Rouge, um, we have a longstanding relationship with um, with uh, Postal Way to Netterville, and that relationship is not professional. Um, some 35, 40 years ago, uh, Postal Weight, uh, well, actually it was Jake Netterville, deemed that it was so important for someone from his firm to sit on the board of directors of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation that they did never pursued any of our finance accounting or audit work. Uh, and that has remained to this day. And so as you can imagine, we are blessed with having uh, at least certainly in my tenure, we have always had a member of the Postal Weight and Netterville firm serve on the board of directors simply because they do not pursue any of our business, uh, which is significant. So they've made a sacrifice in order to what they think is um, a better cause for their partners to participate in. And we appreciate that. Um, thank you for those questions, Kathleen. Care, um, reasonable diligence and inquiry, as we would all do in our own businesses, uh, reasonable reliance on information provided by others. This means that, yes, you can rely on the information and the advice of outside accountants, attorneys, uh, financial advisors, investment advisors, things of that nature. If you are in good faith relying on what you believe to be uh, truthful and accurate information or certainly uh, an experienced opinion, uh, you are free to proceed. And good faith, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about. There are no ulterior motives. Um, I didn't join the board to get the business of the organization, but you, you as a board member are looking out for the best interests of the organization. Uh, director's liability. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> well, that you you as a director have done something that's not simply a mistake. Uh, you may have taken on some uh, overtly criminal activity or some, some self-serving activity that rises to a misfeasance or malfeasance. Um, the business judgment rule, as we discussed, that's that reasonable man standard. You have used your uh, reasonable and educated experience to act in good faith and act as a disinterested party. Uh, if you have done those things, you can avoid the liabilities. Actionable conduct has to be knowing or wanton, meaning you had to know you were doing something that you shouldn't be doing. 
that's pretty that's a that's a pretty clear line that, that's 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 pretty crystal clear i like that one it, it always kind of draws it out for folks to remember what it is that they're doing if you don't think you should do it if you wouldn't want to do it in front of your mom or if you wouldn't want to do it and it have showed up in the newspaper then it's probably something you should be avoiding okay next slide uh, indemnity. Okay, so how does the organization take care of you? In most cases, um, your bylaws, uh, particularly in the nonprofit arena, provide for indemnification, meaning that we will uh, we will protect you in some way if you are accused of libelous actions, libel liabilities uh, that are covered. If you did not, uh, if you simply made a mistake. So if you were not acting against the best interests of the corporation, you can be indemnified. What does that mean? That means that the corporation or the foundation or the organization uh, will cover uh, legal costs and typically will pay any type of judgment or settlement on behalf of those directors who have been so accused. Uh, that sounds expensive. What do, what do organizations do? Well, they buy insurance to cover this. So you have what you've heard of as directors and officers coverage. This is, I've mentioned two documents to you to review. This should be the third document that you ask for and review. Ask your staff to provide you at least a declaration sheet, but you'd like to see the directors and officers liability coverage uh, and have that handy so that you know that it's there, that you know that it's valid and an enforce and that upon renewal that you also are advised that it is there uh, for you. Um, the statute, the relevant state statute provides for indemnity, indemnity if the director is, as I said earlier, in good faith, acts in the best interest of the corporation and a majority vote of the disinterested directors vote in favor of indemnity. indemnity. So that means that, it means be nice to your fellow directors because your fate may be in their hands one day with this indemnity provision. Next question, next slide, please. So what are the responsibilities of the board in general? Uh, it is to articulate the mission of the organization, uh, to determine policy, and to oversee and review the financial situation. Next slide. So what is the mission? The mission is typically set forth in your bylaws, uh, although it may be in a mission statement. Um, look for that. Uh, ne you need to know what the mission of your particular organization is. It should be a fairly short statement. Um, Brent will tell you that it should be no more than six words. Some people will, organizations will provide you with a paragraph. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it just needs to clearly articulate what it is that this organization is supposed to be doing. And it gives you a gauge to see, are we doing that? Um, and then your governing documents, as I said, the articles, the bylaws, and Form 1023. Okay, so Form 1023 is a document we won't cover in great detail today, but this was the application to the Internal Revenue Service at your organization's beginning of its tax-exempt existence uh, to ask to be recognized as a 501c3 or in some cases c4, c5, c6. Um, and you and if approved, you are granted tax federal tax exempt status under 501c3 or the corresponding parts of 501a. Um, this means you're that you're tax exempt. This means that contributions to your organization are tax deductible to the greatest extent of the law. What does that mean? Uh, it means different things for different people depending upon their income level. Uh, but uh, as a part of the CARES Act uh, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this limit has been raised to the to 100% of the adjusted gross income of everyone. So um, this means that very wealthy people can give away large, large sums of money, uh, meaning they can give away everything they made in a year and it is all tax deductible. 
uh, that applies all the way down the line to the lowest of the income who have the charitable intent to do so. Um, typically, uh, giving to a publicly supported charity like most of yours would be up to 50% of an individual's adjusted gross income. And it's different for corporations and obviously it's different for charitable uh, charitable organizations such as the Louisiana Bar Foundation who give money to you through grants. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a great uh, archival document and historical document, and it is a document that is supposed to be maintained as a, public, as a publicly available record. So if, uh, if a member of the public, or really if anyone, uh, walks into your organization and asks to see your Form 1023, you're required under uh, IRS regulations to provide them with a copy of it. Uh, do you have to do it immediately? No, uh, but uh, the internet has made doing so relatively painless now because, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the recent old days, as with many things, if you walked into any, um, any public facility and asked to see a document, you would be required to pay for copying fees. Uh, an organization can do that, obviously, with the 1023, but they can also send you a link to look at it. And a lot of organizations now uh, maintain their 1023 and their Form 990 on their website under some kind of financial section or about us uh, so that it is available all the time. Uh, there's no reason not to. Uh, as you know, uh, in your instances, your tax identification number is public. Uh, it's publicly available. It can be found on the IRS's website. So it is not as sensitive as, say, your personal Social Security number. Um, so there's no need to be concerned about that. Next slide. Uh, policy. We talked about you know, developing and overseeing the policy implementation. So that is you develop the goals and objectives related to your mission. If our mission says that we provide uh, civil legal aid to those in need, how do we go about doing that? What, what steps does the Bar Foundation take to provide civil, civil legal aid? Well, we do it through a number of reasons, but the main one you're here for today is that we distribute grants to other programmatic and operational organizations who are carrying out that mission. So you, in essence, are helping the Bar Foundation to carry out its mission of providing civil aid through the various functions that you provide to your service areas and communities. Um, we hired uh, an executive director to carry out that mission, and that is someone who we evaluate from time to time, and we compensate. Um, compensation, as you know, has become a, an extremely uh, talked about issue. Uh, you keep hearing about exorbitant nonprofit organization um, salaries uh, and compensation packages. Uh, in some instances, uh, what they are referring to are hospital systems. So um, as we have in all of our communities, a lot of folks have a either a state run kind of hospital district that has a hospital, say for instance, uh, uh, St. Tammany Hospital District number two is Slidell Memorial Hospital. Um, whereas here in Baton Rouge, we have Our Lady of the Lake, which is a nonprofit entity through the Franciscan missionaries of Our Lady. So, so what's the difference? Well, you probably could pull and look at both the compensations of the CEOs of OLOL and the CEOs of Slidell Memorial Hospital, and you might see the difference. Is it because one works essentially for a political subdivision and one works for a private entity? Uh, maybe. Uh, is it because one system is much larger than the other? that's more likely and that the problems are, you know, compensation is commensurate with the problems dumped on the CEO's desk. Yes, that's probably likely. Um, but it does trickle down into other organizations. And when, um, when Skip and Ralph Stevens and I were doing this presentation, Skip had a great, had a great story about a, a postal way net a real client uh, who had started, who was a retired a uh, university professor and had started a small nonprofit organization and was, um, was doing great work. Uh, I think paid himself something like $40,000 a year uh, to carry out this work and uh, was audited 
uh, because the IRS said that the uh, one of the issues raised in the audit was that the compensation was too high uh, because the organization had only brought in, I, I forget the number, and, and, and if Ralph were on, he would correct me, but I will say the, the organization brought in $100,000 and he was being paid 40 of it. And to them, that looked like excessive compensation. Um, after, a, after a long struggle, um, pro bono, I imagine, uh, Postal Weight was able to show that the compensation not only was, uh, was correct, it was probably low uh, because not, it was not tied to the amount of money raised or the, or the programmatic uh, distributions, but they looked at other similarly situated organizations that were doing the same or similar type work of the same size and what they found was that this, the, the executive director was being compensated appropriately. How did they do that? Well, they, they looked at surveys. Um, there are organizations who provide consultants that do this. And most importantly, there should be a committee of your board of directors that looks at these issues. And so I know that that's a that's a small kind of footnote at the bottom of this page, but it's very important. Compensation at all levels uh, should at least be looked at by the board of directors. Compensation at the executive director level should be approved by the board of directors. Now, can the board delegate that to a committee? Yes, of course they can. But I would tell you that that is probably the fourth now piece of information that I would encourage you to look at. In some instances, organizations will delegate that, they will approve it at an executive committee level so that they don't have to publicize it to the entirety of the board of directors. But it's going to be in your 990, that information is publicly available, you can go and look and see once that document is filed every year, what a CEO or an executive director makes um, there's no reason it shouldn't at least be disclosed to the members of the board of directors. I will, yes, okay, continuing on. So um, a lot of these things like deferred compensation and perks, again, you will see them in much larger organizations, um, but a lot of times what organizations of a smaller size will do is provide salary and provide some kind of retirement. And retirement can be a valuable component of compensation, particularly when there's, there's, I guess, less resources to pull from. So providing a salary of a certain level, but providing some kind of long-term incentive for uh, retirement is comparable to golden handcuffs, right? You may hire someone great, and if you can retain them through a, a retirement plan, all the better. Uh, so it is, it's important to look at that because you also need to remember that you're hiring an executive director or staff members. You are training them up for the mission. You are investing time and energy in their success. And they're, they have the potential to take, like, like all employees do, they have the potential to take all of that training and all of that investment and leave you and go to another organization simply for um, what may be pretty nominal difference in compensation. So I would encourage you to look at that and understand how you're compensating those folks and also what the, what's the plan? Are we okay if we have a director who's only here for five years or do we want somebody to be here for 20? Um, or is it somewhere in between? So you need to look at that. So compensation, obviously conflicts of interest need to be reviewed and disclosed as we talked about, and that is a key policy issue for the board of directors. And then you need to look at policy being, you look at the policies, right? So you, you need to have an employee handbook, you need to have uh, a whistleblower policy uh, for any transgressions that may take place in the workplace. Uh, and we'll talk about those a little bit more as we get into the 990. Renee, next one. And then uh, finance, looking at the finances, obviously a budget should be reviewed. Um, that should be prepared by staff. It should be reviewed by the board. It should be, um, and you look, it's okay to ask questions. Why are we spending X amount on copy paper? 
Why are we spending? Why on travel? Um, why is our meeting expense so expensive? What What do those things mean in the management of the organization? Because just like you as a board member are looking at your finances, you're looking at your budget, you're looking at your operating revenue and your operating expenses, organizations and people who give you money as a contributor are also looking at those things. They're looking at low costs of operations, how efficient you are in managing the organization. Does your board contribute to your organization and at what level? And do you have 100% participation? Things like that nature. Um, donors have gotten much more sophisticated and the availability of information has allowed them to exercise that sophistication in ways that are unfortunate. And the unfortunate ways are they can choose to take their donation elsewhere if they don't like what they see in the finances. So it's up to you, the board members, to stay on top of the finances, uh, to look at your peer groups and see how they're operating and to uh, put on the most efficient operation possible in order to one, carry out your mission and to two, attract donors to, uh, to your organization. Uh, do you need to engage an auditor? Let me go back to that one, Renee, because audits have become increasingly important as well. In some instances, uh, larger organizations, including national and international funders, so we'll, we'll pick on the Gates Foundation, for instance. Uh, the Gates Foundation may require you to have an audit every year if you're going to be a funded organization of the Gates Foundation. Um, well, that's expensive and we're small and we really can't, we can't bring an auditor in every year to do that. They understand completely um, and it may be that you simply just don't qualify to apply for grants to particular organizations if you don't have an audit. Um, but having said that, an audit also shows outsiders that you are financially prudent in that you are in your oversight of the organization. So, um, so it is something to consider. A lot of organizations will say, we'll produce an audit every other year, or we'll not rise to the level of an audit and we'll produce a compilation in the off year. So we may do an audit every three years and we'll, we'll do a compiled financial statements in years two and three, moving towards the audit. In some instances, those are okay. It also will depend, and many of you who receive any type of state or, uh, or any kind of governmental funding will know that depending upon the amounts that you receive, you also have to file financial reports and in some instances, full audits uh, with uh, the legislative auditor's office or the local, the local government. So say here in Baton Rouge, you've received funding from the city parish, there would be financial reporting that would be required. Um, all of those are things that should be looked at by an audit committee. So is an audit committee your finance committee? Uh, it, it can be. Does it need to be separate? It can be. Um, there's, there's no hard and fast rule for what the audit committee should and shouldn't be. In most instances, folks simply want to see that you have an audit committee. Uh, and here, Ralph, uh, Ralph would plug the AICPA's audit committee toolkit, which is available uh, through their website. Uh, and it is a fantastic uh, piece of information that I would encourage you to go track down. So you can go to the AICPA website uh, and just look for audit toolkit or audit committee toolkit. Next. So we talked about audit. Now I should have done this first and should have told you what it is, but it's an examination of your financial statements and your disclosures. Um, it's, it's an attestation from an outside third party that, uh, that the documents fairly and accurately represent the financial situation of the organization. Um, they are not guaranteed to find fraud. So in, in a lot of instances that we see publicized when, when fraud is alleged or determined within an organization, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, people always say, but they had an audit every year. Well. The audit is, you know, as you know, it is a um, we're, we're, it is a shot in time of one piece of information. So we may have gone to a filing cabinet and pulled out 
five pieces of paper. We want to look at five transactions. Um, and we, we, we trace them. Is this an invoice? Was it paid? How was it paid? Where's the check? Who wrote the check? Did the check clear? Or, you know, yes, this looks good. Uh, but we may not have looked at the piece of paper behind it and determined, uh oh, there's a problem with this one, or there's no backup for this. Uh, so it's a reason why when I submit an invoice, uh, you know, to buy a new law book, I have to have the invoice along with my request to be reimbursed for it so that they know here's the invoice. It was sent by a third party. Here's the book. He has it on his shelf and here's the check. Okay, all that matches up. We can move on to the next thing. So they're not looking at everything. They're only looking at a few things. Next. Internal controls. A lot of small organizations will have issues with internal controls. Why is that? Well, it's because your organization is small and you simply don't have the staff to segregate duties. So money comes in through the mail, who opens the mail, who reconciles the check, who deposits the check. In some instances, that's the same person. Well, an audit would say that's not, that's not a good practice, but they will also note well, you have a two person financial staff and you know, and the other person is doing other things. So how do you avoid that? Well, a lot of times you as board members will be called in to exercise some kind type of oversight or control in that process. Uh, is it, does that mean you're, you're there every day? No, uh, but it does mean that there is another set of eyes and another set of hands that are involved in the process and the auditors and the organization can point to, we're doing our best to eliminate the possibilities for any type of fraud or mistakes. Um, and then another thing on, on internal controls and as a board member, this is something else that <laughs> you, should, you should be aware of. Uh, payroll taxes have to be paid. If payroll taxes are not paid, directors of organizations can be held personally responsible. Um, Skip used to always like to hammer that point home when we would talk about this because it is, uh, that, that is something that most uh, directors do not realize or understand. And that is that the laws are written in such a way to protect the employee in this situation. And so the employee needs to have some assurances that their payroll taxes are being paid. Obviously, the local, state, and federal government would like to see payroll taxes paid as quickly as possible because they want their money, and they will hold any and everybody responsible for not doing so in a timely fashion if there becomes a problem. You see this a lot in small businesses that are failing, that one of the first and biggest expenses that they have, excuse me, is they haven't paid their payroll taxes. It's one of the first things that auditors look at to make sure that, um, that finances are under control. So again, this may simply be a, a report, an assurance. Uh, you wanna see the, uh, you know, you wanna see the four quarterly receipts, um, something like that. But this is where a committee, a finance committee and audit committee um, can take, take that responsibility from the board and then report back to the board that yes, uh, we have seen the documentation that shows that the payroll taxes have been paid for first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, you know, all of 2019, et cetera. Next, Renee. Okay, let me pause there, uh, Renee. I, I don't see anything in the chat, but maybe we could turn on the mics. And if anyone has any questions, I'll stop for just a second. Will this uh, slideshow be available to us offline? Yes, uh, I, I said that uh, very early on when we hadn't officially started, but I've provided it to Renee and Renee, I think that we have a way to get this back out to everyone as I hope that we will do with all of the, all of the materials that we provide over the course of the next few days. Yes, we will also be, this session is being recorded, so we're going to be circulating that to you as well. So if you have any uh, staff members or board members who were not able to participate, you can send them the recording mm -hmm. and the materials. Thank you so much. It's extremely helpful.
it's frightening to know that this recording will be out there for much longer than these uh, this two hour session. <laughs> oh, you're doing a great job. Don't worry any, about it. Any other, any other, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, as I talked about the IRS form 990, why is it important? Well, it is, it is chock full of great information. Um, it is also your, your, as a board member, attestation to the IRS that you're doing a lot of the things that we just talked about, that you, you told them what you wanted to do when you filed your form 1023. And look, and that could have been 50 years ago, right? So you're in a, you're in a long standing successful organization and in 1964, uh, we filed a 1023 and we told the IRS what we wanted to do. Are we still doing that in 2021? That's a, that's a great question. And if we're not, how do we go about making sure that we're still in compliance? Is, it, is there something that we need to do? Well, actually now it is the Form 990. That's how you tell the IRS that something may have changed. If you amend your articles or your bylaws during the year, you report that to the IRS on the 990 and you tell them what changed. <clears throat> if you change your mission in some way, you tell them through the 990. That's how they understand the information. Uh, is there some change in your structure uh, as it relates to um, lobbying? Have you decided that you wanna take on lobbying as a function, people say, first thing they say is, well, wait, nonprofits can't lobby. Well, you can under certain circumstances and with the appropriate reporting that goes along with the IRS Form 990. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Ray, let's go to the slides. So why, why is there a 990 other than, you know, what we call it's a public information return, but in reality, it is the tax return of your nonprofit organization. So if you remember Sarbanes-Oxley, this was the government implementation of additional oversight into the for-profit sector. Very shortly thereafter, uh, Form 990 was completely overhauled uh, as a result of, well, if we did it for the for-profits, let's do it for the nonprofits. Let's overhaul the way that we ask them to report information and what it is that we're looking at. So why did they do that? Well, you'll see five reasons right here. They were concerned that, that people were making contributions of non-cash items and they were overvaluing those contributions. So I've, I've given you a painting it's really worth $50, but I've chosen to say that it's worth $5,000. Well, there's a process for that. Um, you had charities that were established only to benefit the donors themselves or their family members. Um, you were seeing a blurring of the lines between tax exempt and the, and the uh, commercial or, not, or prof, for profit sectors. Um, they were, there was increasing concern about executive compensation and those private endearment issues of entering into transactions that only benefited uh, members of the staff or members of the board of directors. Um, the most prevalent case of this right now, and, and let me say regulation of political activity. So that goes back to lobbying again. Um, if you wanna see a case study in items at least three, four, and five, uh, look no further than what's going on with the National Rifle Association, particularly in the state of New York. Um, you are seeing things, you know, that would just, for many of our small nonprofits who are doing this type of work, it blows your mind to think that the organization was, was buying suits and was paying for private air travel, uh, extensive private air travel and things of that nature. A lot of these are resources that we don't have available to us, but it does, it does show you what it is that the government is concerned about and looking at and that donors are concerned about and looking at. Next slide. So I, I call these the guiding principles for Form 990. They wanted to, the government wanted to enhance transparency, uh, promote compliance, and <laughs> I laugh at this every time minimize the burden on the filing organization. That is, that's absolutely false. 
the burden on the filing organization it has increased uh, because the form has become much more extensive. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but as, as a rule of thumb, we see in a lot of instances, if an organization cannot file its Form 990 in, a, in an appropriate and timely fashion, it probably does not have the capabilities to be in the business of being a nonprofit organization to begin with. So it, it, it has created, for a lot of us in the industry, it has created a gauge by which we can, or we can, we can immediately evaluate the operational efficiency of an organization by looking at their 990. Next. So well, this is where we talk about it minimized um, the burden of filing. Uh, it's 11 pages with 11 parts and it has 175 lines of information, but that's only on the main form. Uh, then it has the instruction section, which has a sequencing list of how you put this together. It has a nine part multi-page, multi-pages to those nine parts appendix. Uh, it has 140 definitions in its glossary. And then you have schedules A through R, which in some instances are also multiple pages. When, just to give you an example, and it, again, we're a very complex organization here at the foundation, but the Baton Rouge Area Foundation files our form 990. It is, um, it has reached as high as 500 pages. In, in most instances, it is in the 100 to 200 pages. Um, so it is an extensive document um, for our organization. In most, you're going to see it, um, you probably only have like one or two schedules that you might have to file. Uh, and that just depends on the work that you're in. If you're a church, there's a schedule. If you're a school, there's a schedule. If you're a hospital, there are multiple schedules. Uh, there are schedules that apply to everyone. There's schedules for just simply overflow information. You, you get my point. Uh, governance and policies. So this makes it uh, this makes it readily available for someone to pick it up and to to look at what best practices are supposed to be. Um, if you can check yes to a lot of these questions. Um, the instructions will tell you that in many instances, it will ask you, do you have a joint venture policy? Do you have a whistleblower policy? Do you have a conflicts of interest policy? Um, there is a box that says no. You can check no for, for many of those things, but I always encourage folks um, to avoid checking no, go out and implement the policy, even if you never use the policy, you have a policy, you're able to check yes, because the guidance from the IRS has always said that no one question will trigger an audit, but they look at the context of the other information. So if you say, we don't have a conflicts of interest policy, there's another section that says, here are our board of directors. There's another section that says, who are, you, who are the five highest paid contractors uh, with the organization. Well, if you checked no, and we see a board of directors name and we see a board of directors uh, company, and, and clearly the layperson probably can't make all of those connections, but the IRS can make those connections. Uh, that could lead to further questions related to your operations. Um, why not just say, well, yes, we have a conflicts of interest policy, right? So that way that they know that there is some organizational oversight. And here's exactly what I just said. Uh, sections A, B, and C request information about policies that are not required by the Internal Revenue Code. I always should say in my presentations, semicolon, but you should have those policies in place uh, and, and look at that. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. Next. Uh, so what are the highlights? Well, they wanna know, uh, who are your who are your board members and what what are the numbers? Um, you know, do you have a twenty person board of directors and uh, nineteen of those are independent and one might be your executive director? Um, is there any type of asset diversion or any types of corrective action that they see from you know those questions? Um, is the board controlled by any outsiders? Uh, is it is are there, are there seven family members on a board of directors? That doesn't make it wrong. They're just looking for, is it, is it potential? Is there potential for control if 
Edmund Gearing uh, creates an organization and puts all of my children and brothers and sisters on the board? Well, the answer to that is probably yes. Everybody will likely do what dad asked them or, or brother asked them to do. Um, so there's the potential for control by other people. Um, the 990 review process. This is one that kind of stumps people when, when they hear about it for the first time. So your 990 uh, should be put together and you as a board should have the opportunity to review it before it is filed. It doesn't mean you have to approve it. It doesn't mean you have to do, take any other action, but you should have a process by which your 990 is put together it is distributed for review and that review is documented. So for instance, in, um, in a lot of, I would tell you in a lot of years, uh, we come down to the wire. We're working with, you know, with outside uh, finance and tax folks to put it together and we've taken the extension and it's November 15th at four o'clock. And here it is, it's finally been delivered electronically because it's so big. Um, so what do we do? Well, we distribute it electronically. We schedule a conference call, uh, and any director who has a question or a comment or a correction, uh, has the opportunity to call in and to make their concerns known or to simply call in and say that they've had an opportunity to review it. So we can document that we received it. We can document that we distributed it and we can document that we gave uh, we gave directors an opportunity to respond. That's all we need to do. So there is a question and a section in the 990 that says, what is your review process? We tell them that. That provides all the coverage that we need. Um, is there any delegation of management control? So for instance, uh, you may see this in some in committee work. Have Has the board of directors ceded any of its authority to, to a committee? Uh, well, in a lot of instances, uh, organizations will establish an executive committee that can act on behalf of the entire board of directors in the interim space between meetings, which, as you know, is significant, right? If your board meets six times a year, um, that's six days out of 365. Uh, but you may have a smaller committee that can manage the organization with full authority uh, during those during those interim periods, um, that's okay. They just want to know that. A contemporaneous doc, contemporaneous documentation of board and committee action. That's minutes. That simply means that you're documenting that you had a meeting. Do you have to do it for board meetings? Yes. Do you have to do it for committee meetings? Yes. You're supposed to. So even the shortest, briefest committee conference call should be in some way, shape, or form documented um, in the form of minutes. That's that, that, that often stumps people as well that they've not been documenting what they would consider to be a, you know, a small working group committee or something like that. Um, doesn't take much uh, in a lot of instances, um, particularly if you have a staff member um, like Renee and her colleagues who are participating with you, oftentimes that they will take the load for that. I know that we here at the foundation do that as well. We provide staff members to staff each of our committees. Those staff members are responsible for the minutes and they'll put them together and then eventually they will go to the full board of directors for review. Um, so we talked about family and business relationships. Um, you also have to look at your, your officers, your directors, uh, some folks call them trustees, depending upon, and your key employees, depending upon your size. Um, those folks could be, could be uh, a part of management. So you'll see a president CEO who serves as a board, a full board voting member. That's okay. Um, are any of your folks um, entering into business transactions that are larger than $10,000 that needs to be disclosed? Um, are you, a, do, do we own businesses together? That, that's not uncommon to see directors uh, who are in business together in some way, shape or form. It could be they come from the same company. It could be that they are in an investment group together or that they simply have a, another venture together. Um, not unusual because like a lot of us, 
we prefer to work with successful people who we have some familiarity with. So um, I, I kind of have a, a running group of folks here in Baton Rouge that I serve on other boards of directors with the, the YMCA or the Manship Theater or the or the or the high school's foundation. Uh, there's a we just we have a little group of us that apparently <laughs> we can't serve on a board without the other people serving on the board together. We don't have any of these financial relationships together, but we all trust each other and we all uh, we, we appreciate what the skills and tools and experience that others bring to the table. So. Um, I, you know, I never want to see one of those guys or gals uh, ascend to the chairmanship of a new organization because that means that I'll be getting a phone call in the next year to say, come join this board. That's OK. Uh, and I'm, I'm joking because it, it, <laughs> I find it enjoyable to work with people that you enjoy being with. And if particularly when you see things uh, in, a, in a very similar fashion. Uh, but this is a way to look at that. Next. Okay, so policy highlights. We talked about several of these, but the questions are, do you have written policies for conflict of interest? And I want you to explain how you do that. Uh, is there a whistleblower policy? Do you have a document retention and destruction policy? And do you have a policy on joint venture participation? The joint venture participation is the probably least talked about of all of these because it, it is it is so rare that organizations will go into uh, a scenario like that, but it is there. Um, we have a joint venture policy here at the foundation and it simply says that our board will uh, will look at the potential joint venture and will make the decision at that level. So it's not delegated to anyone other than the board of directors, very short. Conflict of interest, whistleblower, and document retention and destruction. Those are the three that I encourage every organization to have. Um, whether you were responding to 990 or not, they make sense. Uh, any of us who have been through uh, litigation where documents were needed, we all know that a good document retention policy can, can eliminate um, the hassle of documents if they are destroyed on a regular basis, on a regular documented basis. So um, as in any good organization, um, you may or may not want to be keeping financial records from 15 years ago. Um, but you need to have something that says <laughs> we don't keep financial records past seven years and we destroy financial records, you know, in the eighth year and whatever those may be. And that's just one example. Are there things that you need to keep permanently? Yes, of course, your, your articles, for instance, should be kept. Uh, your bylaws should be kept. Um, in a lot of instances, you'll want to keep records of your grant making for a number of years before you destroy those. Um, does that mean that you have to? No, of course, there's archival and there's historical reasons to maintain information as well. And as long as those are so designated, then they certainly can be kept. But that should be a part of your policy as well. So I would look at, I would look at that. I would inquire with your directors uh, or your, <clears throat> your staff to determine, do you have any or all of these policies? And how have you answered those questions in the past if you don't? Um, so that's a Form 990 check on, well, we say we have one, but we don't have one written down. Um, so we need to have, as it says, written policies. So take a look at that. Um, okay, I'm seeing a lot of chat questions, so I'm going to pause for just a second and pop up there. Uh, let's see. Um, Vanessa, is it possible to get a generic template sample of this joint venture participation policy? Yes. Um, Renee, would you please remind me, and I can, I can provide that to you later uh, today. Yep, you got it. Great, thank you. Okay, next slide. Um, we're, still, we're still with our main um, document. Uh, again, you all should have a Form 990. So um, as, a, as a bit of homework, when you, when you really don't have anything to do, you can take your Form 990 and you can look at this presentation and you can check on the questions and see. 
Oh, and Greg, thanks very much. Greg just provided a link to a sample joint venture policy. Um, okay, so this is talking about compensation and how do we determine compensation for your for your, uh, your, your, your top management. And, and if there are any folks who reach certain levels of compensation uh, at the employee level, it's very rare that, um, that board members are compensated or officers who are not um, staff members are compensated. It does happen, but there are ways to determine that. Uh, what is appropriate? So, we talk about the rebuttable presumption standard. Renee, would you go to the next? We, in that, you have to be able to show the service in some way, shape, or form that you have looked at information that allows for a, 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 um, an appropriate comparison between organizations and positions and once you have done that, then the salary or the compensation packages will be presumed to be reasonable. So you take a look at uh, reportable compensation from other organizations. This has become so much easier and, and, and much to the chagrin of some of the compensation consultants out there uh, in, the, in, in our world because so much of this information is now freely accessible or easily accessible uh, online. Um, so for instance, uh, we, we participate in a group of community foundations that are probably the top 100 uh, as far as asset size in the country. Um, and we all voluntarily put together our, you know, our 10 or so data points that everybody's looking for. Uh, one foundation compiles that information and then distributes a list to us, uh, Usually, it's a, at a very appropriate time. It's usually in August or September of every year. And it gives us an opportunity to take a look at our peer group. So say I can look at, you know, the five above and the five below us, and look at what their compensation packages are, total compensation, base salary, all of those, those line items that are in the Form 990. We can do comparisons on that. Um, you know, what we're not, we're not seeing is tenure. Uh, we're not seeing the innovativeness of each organization. We're simply looking at this on a straight data uh, reporting issue, but it is giving us, um, it's given us great information to be able to pinpoint what a salary looks like amongst its peers, amongst the, the rest of the country, uh, amongst organizations of this asset size, uh, organizations that make this much in grants or receive this much in contributions, et cetera. So it gives us uh, the ability to look at different categories and to make a determination as to what we think might be reasonable. Uh, next slide. So here's, here's kind of here's kind of what you have to be aware of, again, in, in a lot of organizations, particularly at our grantee level, um, some of these salary levels will be will be out of your realm of experience, but it is what they are asking for. So they want to see if you are a current officer, a director, or a trustee, your name is in the 990, and if you are compensated uh, in any way, that shows up. Um, so it can be one dollar, right? Because you're seeing anything greater than zero. For your key employees, uh, anyone who has a total compensation of over $150,000. And remember what we talked about, you, you, have, you have your base salary, there could be some bonus, there could be some deferred compensation, there could be some retirement plan if you're so, if you're so fortunate enough. So that total uh, is now getting, is pushing to a point of, of that 150 level. Then you look at your five highest compensated, regardless of whether they're um, make 150, if they only make over 100, they go into that line. Uh, anybody that did work for you uh, in the previous year who still received compensation, they go on um, officer, director, trustee, as we talked about, who served in the previous year and made anything over 10,000. And then here's that five independent contractors. So 
Uh, did you go out and pay for a study? Did you go out and pay for, um, did you go out and pay for a compensation consultant to come in and look at your compensation and were they paid in excess of this amount of money? So again, those limits are, are relatively high, uh, but it is looking at kind of total reporting threshold. So you have to be careful if, uh, you know, uh, an employee who makes $75,000 may actually bump into that 100,000 range with taxes and, and, and other things. So just be aware of that. Next slide. Um, again, what is an officer? What is a key employee? Uh, these are all things that you wanna be able to look at these and determine who they are. Um, Renee, next slide. I wanna, clearly they are, uh, the service is very concerned about compensation because you can tell by the level of detail that we talk about this in these slides. Uh, again, uh, when we talked about former employee, former director, um, the, who has the over 150, uh, anybody listed on the core form that received compensation from an unrelated organization. Okay, so, so you might see someone who is paid by two different organizations. Um, you may see, um, well, Bar Association or Bar Foundation, those are great examples. We have them around the state. In some instances, uh, an executive director of a bar association of a local bar may also be compensated by another uh, organization, a bar foundation that was set up at some point in their past to raise funding and to see oversight. Those are two separate but related organizations. Um, so depending upon how they are compensated, it could come from both, it could come from one, uh, but they're listed as an other. I'm sorry, it was... Okay, sorry about that, I thought there was a question. Uh, so you just need to look at that. That's what unrelated organizations mean. Next slide. And so all of this, and I failed to, to note that, all of this is, is listed in Schedule J. Um, so when you're putting this together, you, you probably have seen Schedule J. Um, here again, um, some people just find this interesting, but here are some of the, here are some examples of perks that uh, nonprofit executives have received over the years. And so they're listed here, first class travel, companion travel, uh, the the famous gross up provision or tax indemnification, uh, discretionary spending, I can't imagine, but it exists. Uh, housing allowance, um, business use of your residence. This is a lot of times is when there are, uh, um, you're, you're given an allowance for a personal residence, but you're required to entertain from time to time. So there is a business reuse related to it. Um, you, you see that a lot in university system type settings. Um, health and social club dues, not unusual. I, I, personal services, wow. Tax preparation is not is not unusual. The others, you're you're talking about um, seriously well funded organizations that are that are doing that kind of spending. Uh, next. And then here we go. So this is the 990 is the opportunity to tell your story and you can provide as little information as possible or you can tell the story of the organization through not only through the numbers, but through the narrative sections that ask those questions. So it gives you an opportunity. How, how best should you proceed? Well, I can't tell you how best you should proceed. That, that's an individual organizational decision that has to be made. Um, but you should look at, should you have a committee that looks at this? Well, a lot of folks will say, well, gosh, we already have a finance committee and you told us to make sure we have an audit committee. And now you're talking about having a 990 committee. Um, again, those people can all be the same folks. Uh, you might want to have just a few outside eyes look at this. So when you think about it, the 990 is heavily finance uh, driven. So there is a lot of financial information. So who's typically doing that? Well, your finance staff and your 
your treasurer and maybe some outside tax prep folks. Okay, that's one, that is the core team. But maybe you should have an outside set of eyes. Do you have somebody who's great with communications? Do you have somebody who is the legal? Do you have someone who uh, maybe it's your executive director? Maybe it just needs to be someone who is not so close to the finances that they can look at it and see that there's more here that we could be doing or there's less that we could be doing and still be in compliance. That again is an individual decision. So I would encourage you to, to at least as you are looking at your form 990, think about that and think about how you, how you present that face uh, to the rest of the world. Because in a lot of instances, and I'm gonna give you a, a, the most recent and famous example, and some of you may have been beneficiaries of this. Um, this is really the only way that someone can anonymously uh, vet you for a potential grant. Um, and the, the most recent case, as some of you saw most recently, was uh, Mackenzie Scott, the um, Jeff Bezos ex-wife, who has decided that she is going to give away most of her wealth, which came from Amazon, uh, and in doing so, uh, gave away 500 and 40 something grants uh, right around December, um, totaling $1.6 billion. Um, and there were several organizations throughout Louisiana that benefited from that. I know um, food banks, YMCAs, uh, YWCAs, um, there, were, there were no community foundations in the state, um, well, maybe getting off. Um, and several others, but those grants were, they ranged, uh, they, they, were, they were significant. I mean, $2 million grants. Um, the YMCA here in Baton Rouge was one that received one. And um, they provided very, very minimal information when they were contacted. But if you read about the process, you saw that uh, Ms. Scott had engaged advisors who went through a very significant due diligence process. And in fact, so much so that they even identified that there were a couple of hundred organizations that they had initially vetted, but they couldn't get enough information on, so they had put those aside. So there are a lot of people who are crossing their fingers today, hoping that they're in that, that couple hundred number uh, and waiting to get a phone call or an email from Mackenzie Scott to say that you've been awarded another grant. Um, but they're looking at your good work and they're doing a lot of it through data collection on the 990s. So. Think about that as an opportunity, not as a burden uh, when you're putting together and reviewing your 990. Okay, next slide. Um, and th these are just some steps. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I think what I've essentially gives you the opportunity to request information, uh, talk to your board, um, look, at your, look at what you've done in the past and how can we do it better. Next one. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears uh, and talk a little bit about some of the next items that I had mentioned, which are uh, the programmatic and administrative priorities. And it's uh, pretty good timing because I think this takes us into, uh, into a closing. So we'll kind of run through these. Let me see, there's a question. Uh, Lisa, thank you. Do you have a recommendation for a guidebook or favorite website to become more familiar with uh, the 990. There's so much information out there right now. Um, the, the IRS actually through its, through the nonprofit and uh, charitable sector of its uh, website actually does provide a lot of guidance. Um, it's not too dry. Um, a lot of this presentation over the years has come from straight from the IRS so that we can get to the core of what it is they're looking for. Um, is there an easy uh, is there kind of a 990 for dummies? I, I'm not aware of one. Maybe I should write one, but <laughs> it's not time yet. Um, I would tell you there's some websites. If, um, if I do come across some, and I'll take a look at that this afternoon. If I do come across some, I'll send them to Renee and ask her to distribute that as well. Thank you for the question, though. Okay, so moving on to uh, program administrative priorities. Uh, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about, recruiting, uh, retention, um, 
and, and, the, and the relationship here between the board and the executive director, what does all that mean? Um, well, uh, look, I, again, you've, you've heard me say I serve on a lot of boards outside of my, my responsibilities here. And I, I always take the position that my job is to supervise and support the executive director or the president and CEO, whatever the case may be. And there is a difference. Um, their job is to manage the organization. My job is to make sure that me and my colleagues on the board are managing that person. And that management may just be providing support. You get a great CEO or a great executive director, um, well, you know, a lot of board members are gonna say, rock and roll, this is fantastic. You move on, I'll sit, I'll sit tight. That's not really the way it's supposed to be. There should always be engagement. There should always be uh, opinion and an opportunity to share. Uh, as, as we all know from life, not everyone is right 100% of the time, um, but not everybody's wrong 100% of the time either. So there is great opportunity for back and forth between the governing board and the staff who is working through the programming administrative issues on a day-to-day -day basis to take a step back, um, learn from the talent that's there, uh, learn from the experience that's there, uh, and to uh, really help the organization to become, again, more efficient uh, and more productive. And what we all hope for is more sustainable uh, so that it becomes easier. I won't say easy because it's never easy. It becomes easier to do the work that you have set out to do or that you as a volunteer, as a board member, are passionate about spending your quote unquote free time um, in pursuit of. So, we, you know, a friend who said a long time ago, it's not supposed to hurt, it's only supposed to help. Well, that's true, this, this shouldn't hurt. You know, service on a board and even going to work every day as a staff member, it, sh it shouldn't hurt. We should be trying to make it as easy as we possibly can. I think that's a big part of the relationship between the board and the executive director. Are problems going to arise? Of course they are. Are conflicts going to arise? Absolutely. Um, and at the end of the day, the board is the executive director's boss. Uh, they are in charge of compensation. They are in charge of evaluation and ultimately may be in charge of termination and moving on to make another decision. That is something that has to be discussed at a very high level. And, um, and as you can see there, your responsibilities are in that very last paragraph of this little opening comment section. So I would encourage you to, to take some time and think about that. It's not often, um, we shouldn't just as board members punt to the executive director. And for those executive directors on the call, I applaud you and what you do. Uh, and, and staff members and, you know, and remind you that the board member is your boss. Now, <laughs> how does that work? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Renee, next slide. So you, so here it is. The board is a group, right? This is a group think. So you have a board chair and that chair has to guide uh, the process. Uh, you sometimes have board chairs who are very much into, let's just, let's maintain the status quo. Uh, we don't want to rock the boat during my tenure. That's kind of the under the, under the breath saying, um, we can live through these issues. Let's kick this can down the road for another year and then I won't have to worry about it. Okay, of course, that's one way of dealing with it. But you may have board members individually who don't really want to do that and want to take action now. Um, and in some instances, as we all know, we're working in spaces where delay is not beneficial. Um, you know, when I, when I think about uh, education in this state, we really want to make systematic generational changes. When I think about education for my children, those decisions have to be made yesterday because we have, I've got to educate these two children as best I possibly can in the moment. And I can't worry about the aspirational issues that we're all talking about. I think you're gonna run into that from time to time. If folks who are really passionate about the cause and wanna see it, you know, they wanna slay dragons every day. And then you have others 
who are more passionate about maintaining the status quo. It's okay, again, you need all perspectives, um, but you have to remember what needs to be delegated and what needs to be acted upon immediately. And then when I say delegated, I also mean delayed, right? We can move that to another time. So again, uh, here, just a little bit of more narrative. Renee, let's, let's move forward. So what, what does your executive director do and what is the board's role in that? So I think one, um, even though I have it listed as two, it's knowing what the job description is for the executive director. So as a board member and as a board, the group, your job is to hire the ED. Uh, your job is to review and maintain the job description for that executive director. Your job is to determine how much we're gonna pay the executive director. And then you get to the fun stuff, which is you provide the guidance, you provide policy oversight, um, and you support the organization's missions and objectives through that. Then as you move forward, you now have this bright, shiny new executive director and you've, you've talked about policy. A, a year has passed, how'd we do? Let's evaluate the executive director. And these things seem pretty easy, but then you, ha you have to think forward and forward about what's the next step, the next step in the executive director, because it is hard uh, to get out of a rut sometimes. And if things are going well, the money's coming in and the programs are working really, really efficiently and the organization's got a great reputation. Okay, well, you don't really wanna mess with that, but you also want to know, want to have that executive director know as well as your, as your, um, your, your public, I guess, um, that you're paying attention to this. So if all of those things are happening, well, that means you've got a pretty good executive director. Well, what's the thing you need now need to be worried about is will that person, like we talked about earlier, take all of that great training and take all of this great experience and go somewhere else and run another organization? All right, so can we keep them with compensation? Can we keep them with uh, increased responsibilities? Uh, do we need to look at um, maybe changing the way the organization looks at its leadership. And instead of an executive director that goes out and implements this board's policy decisions, you now have a president and CEO. Um, have we risen to that level? And what does that mean? Why, what's the difference between the executive director and a president and CEO? Well, there is a difference. An executive director oftentimes will take the policy implementation direction and go and implement, right? A president and CEO oftentimes provides another layer of vision and responsibility and oversight, almost like between the board and the organization. Um, and I think that there is a difference and, and, you know, and, and people can agree to disagree on that, but I think that oftentimes it's not just the title, um, but in some cases it is, um, and that's, that may be non-committal on my part, but it is, I think, I think it's a fair thing to think about, particularly when you're going through something like a strategic planning session. So, so I, would, I, would, I would tell any of you that, that have questions about that, hold on to that and talk to Brent about that next week if you're able to participate in that session. Let's talk about what's the difference between an ED and a president and CEO and, and, and what does that mean for our organization? So here you have a couple of other things, and I did see a great note that popped up. Um, and thank you for that, uh, my good friend, Jerry Hobby, who said succession plan. And that is something else that needs to be thought about. Well, oftentimes, as Jerry, Jerry, as you know, um, we don't think about a succession plan after you've just hired someone, but you do start to think about it when you get into, well, one, we've had some success. Uh, two, um, this person's been here with the organization quite a while. And as, um, as my friends who have served on search committees know, when you start talking about candidates, you wanna avoid talking about age, but you start talking about their career runway. And some people have a career runway that is shorter than others. Um, and so what do you need to do to uh, be prepared for uh, the next step? And that's number eight, point an executive transition committee when the executive director leaves. But I think before you get to that point, as, as Jerry pointed out, you need to be thinking about how are we going to do this? Is there someone internally who can step in 
Is there someone externally? Is there a board member? A lot of times you'll see board members who will come on back into the organization as, as some type of uh, leadership, even if it's on an interim basis. Um, and this also goes to when you talk about succession, you also need to talk about an emergency plan. Do you have a plan if the executive director was happened to be in the car with Tiger Woods yesterday when the car rolled over in Los Angeles, right? What is going to happen the day after the car accident, the day after the illness, the day after the emergency leave? Um, who's Who's the person who unlocks the door, who turns on the lights, who makes sure the employees get paid, that everything is going on? Do you have something in, plan, in place as a board to make sure that those things happen? Again, a lot of times we will see a board member come in uh, to take that role on in some kind of uh, temporary capacity, but um, it is something that needs to be thought about. Okay, next slide. Okay, recruitment and retention of board members. Uh, this is always great. And I will, I will start it just the way I, I said just a few minutes ago. Uh, work with people that you enjoy working with. Um, a lot of times people are flattered to be invited to be on a board that they have absolutely no interest in the organization or its mission, right? And so what happens? Well, you'll have an absentee board member in a lot of cases. You'll have people who aren't, aren't committed and dedicated to the organization or the mission and so they don't make it a priority. Um, so the questions that you certainly need to ask, and this, this happens a lot of times with a, a good group of dedicated, long-time board members get together to talk about names of folks who may come on as new board members. And you, you know, your, your first thought is, well, you know, I like that person and they're successful in business. They've been generous in the community. And all those things are great. Do they have any interest in what it is that we do? here. Uh, and if the answer to that is no, then it's probably not a great fit. But that doesn't mean there's not an opportunity to educate that person and then potentially learn something about them that may be a good fit for your organization or tell them something about your organization and may tweak an interest that you weren't aware of. So, um, you know, we always kind of talk about folks that we're close to or folks that we've had some type of successful uh, business encounter with or personal encounter with, and we think that that might person might be great. I think there are always the next step. They have to peel back the layers of the onion. So here's a list of things for you to think about. Um, what interests you? Uh, what do you like about our organization? Or what do you like about what we do? Um, previous volunteer experiences, uh, is board service something you're even interested in? And that is increasingly uh, something that we are, you know, we're seeing less and less of. And as a particular generation, um, if you look at folks who are 70 years old, you will see a, a history of, of, of board service and civic volunteerism. If you look at folks that are 50 years old today, you're not seeing as much. And that's, there's two reasons for that. The one reason is, um, is, generationally, baby boomers and Generation X, and now moving on into the others, letters. Um, as a 50-something-year-old, as a if you looked at a bell curve, there are less of us. We're down in the trough of population because there are fewer of us. Our parents had fewer kids. Uh, if you look at baby boomers and you look at the generation behind mine, you're seeing more and more people. And so a lot of times when I hear you know, a 65 or 70 year old business person say, well, I just don't know anybody who's, who's, who's 48, 49 years old, who's been successful. Well, it's not they don't know anybody. There just aren't as many of us. Um, and that's, that's just a, there's nothing we can do about that numbers wise. There are just fewer of this generation. So we start to look at a much wider swath of folks and you're looking at younger folks. And a lot of times, you know, generational bias will come in and they'll say, well, you know, those people aren't young, they're, they're too young, they haven't earned it, they, they, they don't show a history of service. I mean, look, don't discount passion, right? And don't discount smarts. So that's why all of these factors are important when you're looking at board service, um, both for you and for them. 
Um, what skills and training do they have? What skills do you think they will bring to your staff? Um, community connections, again, all these things are very familiar to each and every one of you, but it, but it has to be taken as a whole to look at how we recruit and then how we retain. There's nothing worse than, well, I guess after an absentee board member, the next worst thing is to get a board member who you don't educate about the various aspects of your organization because you then, then don't learn what it is that they're passionate about or want to participate in. So finding what it is that they want to do after they have already expressed an interest in your organization, after they already have brought a requisite skill level, after they've already shown a history of volunteer service in the community, you got them. Now you got to keep them. So keep them interested in, it, in what it is you do by finding what aspects of all of this that you do operationally, that you do programmatically, that you do administratively. Um, I mean, look, hey, you know, sometimes it's as simple as you need a board member check signer who is close and readily available. And you got a board member who's a block away down the street and would love nothing better than have somebody come to their office and bring them a stack of checks and have them sign it or whatever, right? I mean, that's, that is an easy way to engage someone. Um, and it's helpful to you because you need that you need that outside oversight so think about it in in kind of new and exciting ways if you have that opportunity next Renee. so here you go these are all the questions that i have kind of uh, conversationally articulated to you what skills training and resources do you feel like you have to offer um and if these feel like interview questions for potential board members they, they are um a lot of these you uh, maybe as a as a nominator can answer yourself as opposed to asking directly. Uh, but again, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and having these conversations. And in fact, I think in a lot of instances, these conversations would be much better had on the outset than having made the phone call and say, you know, Joe, would you like to serve on the board of directors of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation? Uh, yes, but I don't know much about what you do. Well, see, that's probably not the best answer. <laughs> yes, but you want the tell me, tell me more. So let's have this opportunity. Let's have this dialogue. Let's have this conversation. Should there be board members who take the lead on this? Yes, there should. Should everyone be involved? Absolutely. Everybody can provide names. You know, we've all we've all served on boards or served boards and organizations where you have board members that say, look, I'm happy to serve on your board, but I cannot for either personal reasons raise money or I will not raise money. Uh, I just simply don't want to ask people to do that. Um, that's, that's okay. Not everyone needs to be a fundraiser, but everyone needs to be able to make connections. And this, these are the types of connections I think that, uh, that each and every board member can make. And so as as executive directors and staff members, your job is to encourage your board members to simply do this. I'm not asking you to go, I'm not asking you to ask them for money, but I'm asking you to make the connection, make the connection for you or make the connection for me. And then I'll go have the conversation, whether it's talking about board service or it's talking about development or it's talking about programmatic support. That, that's, that's, that's a resource that every board member brings to you or should be bringing to you. Okay, next. And here you go. This is, these are the questions as a board member uh, or as an executive director, staff member, recruiter, et cetera, that you should be able to answer. And I think these are important. You know, I, I kind of go down two thirds of the way down the page. What are the major issues this board is facing? Or I'd say this board slash this organization is facing. I mean, no one wants to go into a service like this and then find out that there are problems, but they don't mind finding out there are problems and that they're being brought in to help solve the problems. Um, so I think looking at this list of questions, um, why are we unique? Um, where, we, where have we had difficulty in handling a situation? Um, what do you want me to do? I, I distinctly remember years and years ago, a board member walking into his first board meeting, he sat down, he listened, and he kind of hung around after the meeting was over. And, 
and our president went over to him and they were chit-chatting and known each other for 25 years. And he said, so why am I on this board? That was, that was after a recruitment process, after um, an annual meeting election, and after sitting through a first board meeting. And it just showed us that we had not done a great job either as a board or as an organization of educating this person on what it was that we wanted to do. He, he, in, he in fact, was a doctor and everyone's thinking in their, in their, you know, we got you on this board so that you can help us with the medical community. I don't think anyone ever said to the man, we invited you to be on this board so that you could help us make connections inside the medical community. Um, and it took, you know, it took that month long, month long process to get to that point. Um, that was a fail on our part. Uh, we had to do better. So we've done a better job of articulating both as a staff and as a board to potential new members why it is that they're there. And it's not simply a reward for great service throughout the community. It is, you know, we, we do want you to we do want you to work. We may not call this a working board, but you do have a fiduciary responsibility and we do want you to provide us with some some of your resources, whatever those resources may be. Next slide. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm treading a little bit into Brent's uh, Brent's area, and he will he will get much more into this than I am. But um, you know, the old SWAT test every once in a while doesn't hurt. Look at the organization, do a self assessment. Are we doing a good job? Um, what does that assessment look like? You have a list of of, of questions here. I hope that next week Brent will um, reinforce these and agree that these are all important things to be looking at. But, um, you know, self-evaluation um, and reflection is a, is a great thing for an organization and these should be done from time to time. Strategic planning, annual planning, how do you get to the results of what you said you wanted to do in a strategic plan? You do it by annual plans. You, you take a little, little piece every year and you try to get to that goal. Um, how are we doing? Well, staff may say one thing, the board may say something completely else. Is that a communication issue? Do we need to address that? So self-assessment, <coughs> excuse me, self-assessment is a way to uh, get feedback uh, from and to the board, uh, between the board and the staff on how well we think we are operating. Uh, very, very important. Next. And what's our role in the community? Um, if I am outside looking at your organization, what do I see? Um, what do I know? What do I hear? Um, is your ability to communicate to the community, is it related to your resources? Uh, we simply don't have the resources to get our message out the way we want to. Um, okay, that sounds like a strategic plan issue. That sounds like something we need to put top of the list and then we need to figure out how we're going to implement that. Are there resources available for that? Um, and how are we doing? So if, let's, let's go back to Lynn Pick on the Gates Foundation again. If the Gates Foundation were to come in and look at you and say, gosh, you know, they're, they're really doing a great job and they will be, they will give you a critical evaluation in their process. Um, what would they say? I think it, 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 it helps to know what others know and think about you unrelated to your mission because we can all we can all get you know the blinders on when we're working we're doing our work it's the day-to-day -day grind we're helping people we're spending money we're paying our employees the lights are still on you know the board is showing up they're active and engaged and you know i call the mayor and the mayor has no idea who you are or what you do Okay, and that may or may not be a good thing. Um, again, that's something that you need to know in your community. Are the, are the people in your community, the influencers in your community aware of what you're doing and how important it is? I think that is something that everybody, the board, the staff, um, the beneficiaries need to be actively engaged in because you are, um, Certainly as a board member, you are the, as it says right there, you're the ambassador uh, from the organization to the community. Um, so what, what you project about the organization is one thing, but it also is important to listen to what the community is saying about what you're doing. 
um, you may be doing great work and you just, that nobody may know about. Okay, there's a couple of more slides. This is perfect. We're really getting close. I don't want to, I want to make sure we have a few minutes for questions. Um, should the board raise money? I don't know, uh, but here's some things to think about. Uh, you're responsible for the performance. So knowing where the revenue is coming in um, and how, how will you continue to perform? That's important. Um, are, you, are you doing something individually to help with the strategy? So are you participating and supporting the board? That's always kind of the key test, right? We go back to recruiting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> recruiting board members. Are they willing to make a financial contribution? That's that's one. And then what's that expectation, right? So let's let's articulate that. Let's communicate it. Let's get it out to folks. Um, you know, we'd like every board member to give us hundred dollars a year. Okay, that that doesn't seem like a very high bar. But as we as we know from some of our work with the LSCs, that you know you have a very diverse uh, group of folks who serve on those boards of directors. That could be difficult. But how else can we be of assistance? It's not always about money. I want to make that very clear. Um, yes, the board should raise money, but individual board members may not all be responsible for raising money. I think that's the that's the that's the expectation. Renee, next slide, because I think this one's on the same lines. Yeah, there it is. Um, do you have the funds needed by the organization to do the work? Uh, do you have any kind of cash reserve, any cash flow, um, uh, smoothing opportunities, line of credit, anything like that? Um, and how will you pay for the next um, either capital item or emergency? Right, and we've all seen emergencies, particularly in the last in the last year. Um, and what does that rise to? Uh, are new computers something that you have planned every three to five years, or every five to seven, depending upon your capabilities? Um, you know, how do you maintain a, a nice presence? Carpeting. I mean, all this sounds sounds. It may sound like, gosh, there's so much need out there. How can we afford to recarpet the office? Well, if a donor walks into your office and sees that it's not well taken care of, then what do they think about their money? Are you, are you taking care of their money and are you using it in an appropriate fashion? It'd be easy to say, well, we didn't recarpet the office because, but at the same time, you want to put on a good face for the organization. And I know that those aren't always the priorities, but it is something for the board to think about. There are people when asked appropriately who recognize that you, not every dollar needs to go to programming, that in some instances, we do need to help you pay the light bill. We do need to help you repaint the building. We do need to help you uh, maintain your presence in the community in a positive fashion. And so they're, they're, they're perfectly fine to pay for things like that if and when asked. Um, but again, uh, the final point I think is, it goes back to the values of the organization. How do we maintain um, our standing in the community? How do we pursue our mission? How do we implement our policies? How do we develop and prosecute our programming um, based on our cultural, ethical, moral values as an organization? And what are those? Renee, I think we may be getting close to the end here. So fundraising success looks at leadership. It looks at your expectations for the organization. Um, it looks at, diff at diversity, um, successful fundraising strategies. And, and look, there are many more of you on this call who are experts at fundraising uh, and have much more experience than I do. So these just take these Take these all as simply guidelines for those for those of us that aren't. Um, <clears throat> mentoring and training, look, those are all very important things, but that outreach and those development activities are crucial to the sustainability of your organization. Next. That's it. That's it. I, I thought there was an end that said, you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
but after 46 slides, I guess that's plenty. Um, I see, let me look at some chat here. Uh, Jerry, thank you again. You, you pointed out business continuity plan that goes back to kind of that emergency situation, but it also looks at, um, you know, how are we going to operate if, uh, if the power is out for an extended period of time or if the water is out. So for our friends in North Louisiana who we're all thinking about and have all been there, my parents live in Natchitoches. So we're, we're on day five to seven without water. I completely understand. Where are you going to go? Do you have a backup? Um, I think what we learned a lot about ourselves as organizations and individuals this past year is that we can work from anywhere. Um, so how do we work together from anywhere? And I think that's the challenge for folks who are faced with um, these urgent type situations that only really affect you and not the community at large. Um, you've got to get your people safe. You've got to uh, secure your, your building or your office. And then you have to be out on the streets doing whatever it is you do as quickly as possible, all the while kind of managing this situation. So Jerry, that's a great point. Thank you for adding that as well. And then um, a lot of thank yous. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, this can this can be tedious at times, particularly when you start talking about a lot of IRS forms. Um, but I do appreciate everyone's um, participation. And I think that we have, um, Renee, it looks like we still have about five minutes. So if there are any questions or if you want to unmute the mics and have people just ask. If not, I can let you go. This is not a CLE. We can leave whenever we want to. So. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you very much. First, thanks for being with us. Um, I have a question. Please. Could you, could you do continuity planning training? May. Um, I think there's some concern that, um, that it be thorough oh, enough. Um, yeah. And that might be a, a really that good follow-up for us, given all the I'm, I'm emergencies we've ended up yeah. facing. You know, that's a, that's a great, first of all, thank you for the question. That is a great suggestion. Um, Renee, let's take, let's take that and talk to our committee because uh, as you know, this is, this is not something that we anticipate doing every year, although we now, we now have a committee at the board level that is established for this purpose. So, this training does not, you don't need to talk about the 990 next year, but business continuity training might be something that you we need to call me earlier? Uh, So thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I guess oh. as long as I'm chair of the committee, we'll certainly consider it. I've been doing it. And it, every time I think I'm done, I think of some other thing that needs to be considered. Yeah, it's like painting one wall in your house, right? You right. So if I had a checklist of everything I needed to cover, I could actually put the folder up oh thinking that it's gosh, done. I was, um, yeah, there's so many aspects to that that, that are, um, um, you know, and, and I appreciate when I have the insurance expert and the finance expert with me uh, doing this or doing a similar presentation of this because we're able to bring um, different points of view or different things to consider that are all important. You know, there's no, one's not any more important than the other one and you got to do them all. Um, so you pointed out exactly the problem. It is, it is a wide ranging issue that can consume your time and you get back to how do I ever get back to doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing if I'm dealing with all of this. Thanks. Um, will the recording be available? Um, Renee, I don't know what the timing is on that, but yeah, the answer is the recording will be available and we'll get something out to let everybody know, Renee. Yes, we'll be sending out the recording from all three trainings as well as all materials um, from each training. So keep an eye out for that email. Great. Um, uh, no other questions in the chat. And um, we still have a couple of minutes, but if there are, oh, let's see. <clears throat> no? Well, let me, let me again say uh, thank you to you all, and I appreciate all the, all the kind comments and thanks. Um, this is very rewarding for me uh, personally, just because it, this is work that I do every day. 
and to get to share a little bit of that experience uh, with folks with, you know, with, with diverse size and shape and mission to organizations is a great privilege. I hope you found some tidbits of usefulness in this. I hope that the, uh, I think maybe when you have the actual PowerPoint itself, that will give you some great guidelines. Um, the presentation, it is what it is, right? It's, you're, you're looking at me with a great uh, swamp scene behind us from our post-Katrina uh, photography that we had done. Uh, but uh, on behalf of uh, Skip Phillips as the chair of the Bar Foundation, and Donna Cuneo, the executive director, we are, we are grateful for the work that you do for all of us. As I said, your mission is carrying out our mission. Uh, your success is our success. And we want to be able to provide as much, um, as, as much support and as many resources as we possibly can, not just financial. And this, this, these next three days, or next two days now of training, I hope are a small step in that direction. If there are any questions that come up uh, or anything that, um, that you find interesting related to this, or, and quite frankly, if you found anything incorrect in my presentation, please let us know and we'll get it fixed uh, and we'll get good information back out there to you. But anything we can do to be helpful. Um, again, this is such important work and we appreciate the investment of time that you're putting into not only this training, but also to the, uh, to the assistance that you provide to folks around the state. It is greatly appreciated. And I don't see Renee waving at me and telling me I've missed something. It is 1057. I think, Renee, we can adjourn at that point. Thank everyone for their time. Good. Thank you all. I dropped in a quick question in there oh. in the chat. Quick question. I was basically just asking, do you guys have like a, a, a curriculum or over a year, a year kind of high points that the board can kind of look at or educate themselves or recognize, hey, here's how you can assess whether or not what you're looking at actually is meeting standards and things like that? I do not, um, but that is a great suggestion because as you said it, I started thinking about the things that go on here throughout the year and that it just come, they've become routine, but I don't know that we've ever documented it. So um, I, I will commit to working on that and putting that together. Uh, and Renee, we'll get that, that may be a little bit later in coming, but we'll get that back out to everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if no one has anything else, then thank you all very much. And uh, we will see you again on Friday at 9 a.m. Um, and I will have several of my colleagues who will do the introduction for that. But um, um, there will be LBF board members and staff participating in that session as well. So. Uh, again, thank you. Take care. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, Edmund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Edmund. Thank you.